dreams are fascinating to humans from the dawn of time. We all think they mean something and we all think that the meaning is uh, critical to our existence in the awake world. Dreams are meaningful for our awake life, independently of the story that we experience when we are asleep. And, you know, psychologists have built theories and, and disciplines on interpreting dreams. You wake up in the morning, they tell your story and they try to tell you what it means. However, up to, I would say, the last 15 years, we didn't have access to dreams. We had access to the stories people tell about dreams when they wake up. Come neuroscience, and neuroscience allows us now to look into your dreams directly. So we don't need you to wake up and tell us the story. We can look into your brain uh, while you're sleeping and decode in a very crude way, not as impressive as it may seem right away, but in a way that already is improving day to day. Look at your dreams. So now, when we can do that, we can start answering basic questions like uh, are dreams similar to the story that we wake up? The answer is sometimes, not always. Uh, do uh, the dream time align with uh, real time? Turns out it is. Like five minutes in a dream, five minutes in the real world. Uh, can you solve problems in dream? Yes. Can you be more creative? We start answering questions that are kind of really interesting. And uh, also, we're starting to realize what's the function of dream. Why do we have to, to begin with? What, what do they give us? What can we do with them? And in that sense, one of the things we learned is that dreams are partly our brain's way of simulating things we desire and seeing how they actually feel. And the nice thing about a dream is that it simulates reality as well as it gets. For the time of the dream, for the period of the dream, you think it's reality. You don't say, oh, it's virtual reality, I can take the goggles off and it's going to be over. You actually think it's going through, through as it is. And it, so it filters through your emotions and you actually get a visceral experience of that. So when you wake up, you might not remember anything about the dream, but the emotions about the experience are still there. And then when you talk to your wife and you say, you know what, I don't think we should do that. I feel that it, we want to enjoy it. It's going to hurt our relationship. You don't know why you have a feeling, you call it a decision that's based on something, but actually your dreams allowed you to simulate that in the ultimate VR experience and learn something from that. We can also now start directing them. So not just reading your dream and saying, okay, this is what your dream was, let's talk about it. You can even go to sleep and say, I really want to dream of Oklahoma. Can you help me? Can you stimulate the right parts of my brain or give me the right kind of cues so that my dream will take to Oklahoma so that tomorrow morning I will have a clue because I really don't know. And that's a step kind of forward, which is we don't just think of dreams as something that happens to us but we start taking the reins and we say, okay, we need a dream for something, but we're gonna be the person in the driver's seat. Okay, so lucid dreams are uh, moments where while dreaming, your consciousness wakes up, as in you're aware of the fact that you're dreaming, but you don't wake up. You're in a dream, but you're fully aware of that experience and you say, okay, I'm dreaming and I'm also the director, so I can do what I want. And I think the majority of people, what we know uh, from dream reporting uh, are doing is they immediately open the window and they start flying out. Uh, because it's a movie that you're the main actor. In. That's what lucid dreaming are. Uh, there is, a lot of benefits to them. It turns out that you can both enjoy the entertaining part of that, but you can also use that to say eliminate the trauma. So let's say in your dreams you keep going back to the explosion in the tank and you can't get away from it. You either wake up in a sweaty palms and like high heart rate or you just live through a nightmare. Now we can say, okay, we're gonna bring you to this situation, but for the first time you can fix it. In your dream you can actually save your friend who's in a burning tank or you can actually call help. Like you can do things and suddenly this allows you to really navigate the station differently, which helps your brain see things differently. Maybe you were injured, now you're not injured. You can actually now walk on two legs where you cannot do in the real world. It becomes, it, it's real. So, so, so in many ways, you, it's a short-lived experience, but it's, it feels real to you. Like you feel like you're actually walking. If you're, if you're in a wheelchair and you can never walk again, and suddenly you can run, that is, a moment of joy that's worth the uh, everything. 
I'm a professor of neuroscience and business. I spend my time studying the brain and helping companies implement knowledge of the brain to make better decisions in their day-to-day -day experiences. I was born in France. I was raised in Israel and I now spend a third of my life in the US. I guess what I'm known for, regardless of anything I would do as a neuroscientist, is the fact that I spent a decade of my life as a computer hacker. I think as a young kid, I was probably not different than many others in that I was puzzled by the big mysteries of life. I just didn't know that science can answer them. So I was asking questions, I think, like every kid asks when they're about 10 years old next to a bonfire. Um, how did the world begin? Are there aliens? What happens when we fall asleep and we wander outside of our mind? Is God out there? Things like that. It's just that uh, later on in life, about 15 years after, I learned that actually there are people in the world who try to answer those questions and actually make a way towards giving them answers. The luck part in all stories had to be with me meeting a person who happened to be a neuroscientist, who was a, an older a neuroscientist who retired already, but also had a Nobel Prize a, to his a, a arsenal, who happened to be himself a hacker during World War II. And he kind of found some kinship in my story and his story. And he said, oh, if you're a hacker, your talents are really useful in uh, the realm of neuroscience. Why don't you change careers and go to neuroscience? And this conversation was enough to push even further uh, a negative that was already in my mind. All of those combined, mix them and kind of put some dressing, uh, makes a kid one day say, okay, I'm going to take a leap of faith and I'm going to leave the time Israel towards California and try my chances in neuroscience. So science is not as glamorous as it may uh, seem uh, on a, a TV show or when you see the Nobel Prizes awarded in October or even kind of on a CNN conversation where someone just describes how they found solution to Corona. It involves a lot of bipeds and uh, lengthy nights with nothing working and uh, failed experiments. That said, I think that I was, uh, again, a bit lucky and a bit uh, kind of correctly planned uh, as to how to manage my risks. So when I joined a lab in neuroscience saying, here's what I want to do, my advisor, my PhD advisor told me, look, here's what you want to do. It's ambitious and it's risky and it's interesting, but you need to get a PhD. So we'll do two things. You'll do the risky, ambitious and interesting thing. And you're going to do another project that is very clear, mundane. It won't be a headline in a talk show, but it will be interesting and relevant. It's going to put a dent on the research. It's going to be one more thing that we need to know that's not glamorous. And you're going to do that first. And I will choose that for you. You don't get to choose what it is. Like you choose the one you want, and I choose the one you do on top of the other one. And you start with that. So I started by doing something that it seemed to me in the beginning kind of like, you know, painting the fence. Uh, if you're familiar with the Karate Kid uh, uh, analogy, kind of uh, doing very uh, kind of routine science. Turns out that the routine science was fascinating to me. And I think it's a lesson for a lot of people. You, you take a small task that you think, oh, that's just me kind of doing something so I can get to something else. And if you do it well, and if you do it, you will find it interesting because the brain wants to find meaning in things. You will find nuances in there. You will... Uh, start seeing where it could go. I fell in love with a small project uh, and, and it was kind of what got me going every time the big one failed again and again. In the end, they both kind of are part of my life. The big one also materialized and, and in a way uh, allowed me to kind of pursue what I wanted. But I think that both of them are what I love. The big project, which is probably what I'm known for as a neuroscientist to date is uh, the study of human beings with open brains and electrodes inside their head while they're awake. It's rare. It's not something people often do. Most neuroscientists study the brains of humans using machines like fMRI or EEG that image the brain from the outside. Rarely do we get a person that lets us open their brain, stick electrodes inside and keep them connected to our computer for days while they talk to us and we can look at the inside of their brain as it operates. Uh, those are 
unique individuals that have some brain disorder that requires a surgery is the platform that allows us to actually open their brain and look inside. And once you do that, you can ask the big questions in science. And you can ask questions like, where are your memories sitting? Really, can I touch your memory? Or can I change your decision by just zapping one cell and making it operate differently? All the questions that I was interested in that I didn't know you can even ask and suddenly became reality. And I kind of think that it's a joke, but I actually think it's true in many ways, uh, is that the brain is the most beautiful organ in the human body. But then when you say that, you ask yourself, which organ is making you say that? And that's also the brain. In that sense, uh, uh, I think it's uh, the part of us that uh, we think is us. So when I talk to you right now, I think it's like all of this body that's here is me. But the reality is that it's my brain talking to your brain. Like kind of the brain is is the only part that speaks for me. And in a way, me is sitting only in like a couple of pounds here. Everything else are kind of peripherals of the brain. My hands, my arms, my legs. If I lose them, I'm still going to be myself. If I lose a part of my pinky in a car accident, it would be sad, but I would wake up the same person. But if I lose a similar size part from my brain, I might wake up a totally different person, not even recognizing myself, I have different memories. So the brain is the story of ourselves. So traumas are usually a kind of system, a, a, a not failure, I wouldn't say, but like a, a, a difference uh, in how the systems work. So in, in theory, the way memories are expected to work is you create an experience and it becomes a memory. And then this memory sits there. If you use it a lot, it becomes more strengthened and you have more access to it. If you use it little, it kind of starts fading away and you might forget it or you might kind of uh, not have access to all of the aspects of it. And one way to keep memories active is to actually use them. So let's say you had an experience and you tell your friends about it. By telling your friends, you kind of open the memory, loaded it for this time of conversation. And then when you're done, put it back in the, in the file. This is what allows us to adapt and to keep changing and to keep fixing the narrative of our life. So it works perfectly. Trauma is a failure of the system. Trauma is a situation where you load the memory, tell the story or experience it, and then you don't change it at all. And you can keep the same memory as it is. So the system that's supposed to help us get better and rewrite things so we can go forward with life without relieving the bad experiences doesn't work. You keep going back to the same memory and you don't change it. And that's what's happening when the memory is painful and our brain clings to it and doesn't let us get away with it. Like we keep seeing the same tank explosion in Afghanistan or the same breakup. All of those things, they keep coming back and again and again and our brain cannot let go and it cannot change. And that is where input from the outside is helpful. That's why people go to therapy or talk to their friends. They kind of force someone else's view into their memory with the hope of gradually changing it and making it better. Bad experiences are unpleasant, but they're also not something that we want to totally get out of our life and just say, I want like, to shelter myself. You learned maybe as much maybe close to, maybe more, but a lot from bad experiences as much as you did from good ones. So this breakup that uh, you couldn't stop thinking about every time you woke up in the morning and thought, I'm never going to be able to uh, fall in love again and wrote poetry, maybe led to great poetry. Maybe it led to the next relationship being better because you knew what mistakes you made and you didn't want to do them again. If you just kind of try to say bad, I don't want it, you will not uh, get kind of different. Uh, the brain, to be a little bit more technical, has essentially a system for learning that's very simple. It tries something and then it gets two types of feedbacks. And those feedbacks either strengthen connections in the brain or weaken them. Those, those feedbacks are either reward system, it's set in a place called the nucleus accumbens, and it's the place that basically after you do something, gives it a score. How good was it? One to 10. I'm simplifying. 10, let's do more of it. One, let's do less of it right, in the future. And there's another system in mainly the insular cortex, the insula, uh, pain. You do something, 
comes back feeling of pain, you try to actively rewire. Like do not just do less of that in the future, but no, do the opposite of that in the future. Those two feedback loops happen all the time. Every time you take an action, we learn something. We order the salmon, we get an immediate reward for making a choice. We love that. But then we take a bite and it's disgusting. And we get a pain and we say, okay, don't trust this part of your brain that made choices because it failed us. So next time there's the options, listen to this one less, listen to this one more. And, and then you learn that that one make a mistake too. So you say, oh, what am I going to do? So I'm going to take a guess next time and see. You, your brain does all of those things under the hood, but it tries things and it learns from things and it uses those reward and pain systems continuously to evaluate experiences and learn from them. And in that sense, the bad ones are half the system. We know that the brain changes a lot more between the ages of zero to five than it does between five to 12 and 12 to 17. And then it starts slowing down and changing less and less. So if you have kids and they're between the age of zero to five and you wanna, so to speak, hack it to their brain by say, making them speak more languages, that's the critical time for that. Like if you if you teach them languages between zero to five, they will acquire mother tongues. So they will have three mother tongues and they're gonna create enough space in their brain to speak each language as if it's their mother tongue. If you start teaching them languages at the age of 12, they would still acquire them pretty accurately, but it will become harder to make it into mother tongue. They will start translating from the new one into their mother tongue and then say it in the mother tongue and then translate it back. It will still be easy to learn, but it won't be the same. And if you start to learn language at our age, 20, 30, 40, you can learn, but it will never become your mother tongue. So one aspect of hacking your brain is figuring out the right time in your life to train this brain. Another thing uh, which aligns with the same kind of concept is that there are timing even in the life of older people where the brain is more malleable. For example, when you sleep. So sleep is one of those moments that uh, nature gave us for our consciousness to essentially be dormant and for processes in our brain to do their job. And that job would be to strengthen memories, to eliminate bad memories, to rehearse memories, to do this thing where you kind of load a memory, change it and modify it. All of those things happen when we sleep. So knowing that and knowing specifically which window of the sleep is the window by which process one happens versus process two could allow people to now use it for the advantage. If you really want to uh, rehearse uh, French history, because you have an exam tomorrow and you know that memories get strengthened during a period of the night called slow wave sleep, you can actually trigger uh, an activity that will make you use this process to rehearse French Revolution history, and then you might remember it better when you wake up in the morning. The people we interact with input our brain whether they try to like persuade us and actively try to give us content, or whether they just act next to us and our brain absorb them. Writing down thoughts is helpful. Uh, the process of writing forces you to uh, think it in different words. It slows down, it takes longer to write. So you actually have to pause and not just like, if, if someone tells you, if, you, if you were right now sitting in front of the bus station, waiting for the bus, bored, say, oh, I'm gonna think of my life. Suddenly your entire life will flash in like, I'm saying, okay, I thought I did it, I done. But if you had to tell someone about your life, 20 minutes will pass easily. Because it's the same thought that you have all your life, but saying it in words, requires a narrative, it requires a, a, B, C, and arc, writing, journaling, talking to others. All of those things, they help the brain see the same story in a different light. I would say the kind of, if people have been given diaries and questionnaires for a while where they were asked, kind of, what do you want in life? I would boil down the answer to one word, happiness. That's the thing that uh, most people uh, say they want. They just have different uh, theories on what would give them that. If you ask people, okay, what would make you happy? A lot of people think that money makes you happy. They kind of list in the top five things, money. Uh, other people say relationship. Like if I just married the woman I love, or if I just found the guy that I uh, dream of, or if two of us would have kids, that's another kind of big theme. But uh, either way, people have theories on what will make them happy. And unfortunately, most of the theories are not true. 
uh, there's a name for that in psychology. It's called the treadmill effect. You walk towards a goal, you get there, and you actually realize that you are in the same place that you were before because it's not it. Uh, for the most part, people who wanted money and got the money did not change their happiness. People who wanted uh, money and lost a lot of money did not decrease their happiness. People who got married did not, you know, there's a spike. If you wanted to uh, have a kid and you have a kid for a few weeks, months, days, you will have a spike in happiness very quickly. The case, if not to uh, where it below it was before, at least to where it was before. So I think that the goal of happiness is probably shared among all your audience members and viewers. How to get there is a different thing. And science can tell you, first of all, what doesn't get you there. The things I said before, money, uh, kids, relationships, all right. What does? And those are sometimes mundane things people don't uh, believe in, or even if they believe, say, yeah, yeah, come on, but not me. Like, I will need the money, or fine, but I'm not willing to do it. And for give an example, uh, sleep, high quality sleep. If you go to sleep every day in good time and spend many hours and not use a lot and so on, you're going to be happier in the days after a lot more than if you made a million dollars. They're probably aligned on the one word answer, which is they want happiness, or some people see it as the reverse, say minimize suffering. But either way, that's what people want. That's probably true for a lot of people. How to get there uh, requires a little bit of work on knowing what's the right goal and how to get it. First of all, many people, uh, if you ask them about kind of happiness, uh, they have a kind of a, you know, a a theory when I'm gonna be happy, I'm gonna be just happy all the time, smiling like kind of a cartoon character in a in a kids movie. The reality is that it's not how happiness looks. It's made of moments, and in that sense, many people, if they kind of pause and look at their life, they realize that they're already close to being there. It's just that they're not aware of it. Like I think there's there are studies on like people being asked, "How happy are you?" Moment to moment, turns out that most of us are kind of able to find joy and in, in, in small moments, like when when some, some, something nice happened. In that sense, if you kind of lower this uh, expectation for like peak happiness continuously forever, you will realize that you're already close to there and with a few tweaks, you can get more of it. So that's kind of one positive in, in just remove the label of I want to be happy, which is me being on a high constantly forever. That's never happening to anyone. When you get there, you just get used to it and that becomes your no norm and only something else. Never, so okay, that's one. The other thing is, of all the things that I could kind of recommend that uh, that give you the experience of happiness moment to moment, like you don't need to get to a goal, it's relationship with people. So uh, a lot of people report that just having interaction with people, ideally positive ones, but even not always positive, just the, the mere interaction, is really, really helpful to feeling happy. Time passes differently. You, your brain processes information differently. You have to tell your story and load memories and change them. All of those things are enough to actually affect our brain positively. So if you're looking for a way to kind of right now get this long lasting feeling of happiness that people imagine, I would say focus on having positive relationships in your life that you cultivate and interact with often and you will when you look back at the last week and you say okay what happened you say oh i was happy 90% of the time and because i spent 90% of the time with people and that, that, that would be closest to what people have in mind as a theory of happiness <laughs>